Hey there, what's up? I'm Priyanka from Let's Talk College and in this video we are going to talk about the different components of the college applications process. Now just a quick background about this series. If you've ever attended a live event or the ones on the whether that was in person um, or whether that was via Zoom, then you know that the last couple information sessions that we do tend to be anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours. And that's just a lot of information for one person to process. So taking that into account, the libraries team and I decided that we'll have basically a couple of short videos. Uh, the goal is about 15 minutes or less, just talking about the different components of the entire process. And that way you can watch them at your own convenience and based on whatever topic it is that you want to learn about. So with that said, let's start get started on the different components of the college applications process, the overview. Now, there are four different components. First one is the coursework. Second, we have testing. Third, the personal. And finally, the fourth, we have the miscellaneous. So, and maybe the third and fourth could be mixed in some ways, but I just like to separate them out. There's no official way to separate them. This is sort of just a category, a categorization system that I've come up with. So you may see it organized a little bit differently depending on which website or um, consultant or whoever it is that you speak to. But ultimately these are all still important components. It's just, they can be shuffled up with the umbrella that they fall into. So with that said, coursework. Now coursework varies by student, it varies by school. And I know there are a couple of rules that students have to follow when it comes to not, let's say for Barlow, no taking AP classes before 11th grade. But ultimately what universities want to see is a variety in your coursework. Meaning, don't just take all the difficult classes and drive yourself completely insane trying to get everything done and struggling and not getting enough sleep and all of that. Don't do that to yourself. But at the same time, don't take just the easy classes where every life is just so easy. You barely think about school and you're not really using your brain um, to really learn and get into the subjects. Instead, the balance is somewhere in between where you kind of shuffle up a couple of, mix it up with a little, a few easy classes with a couple of difficult classes um, and just find your balance. So that's not to say again, that you can't challenge yourself. Of course, that's the point is challenge yourself, but just don't overdo it. Cause I know that we tend to find that a lot of um, that the competitive universities want the higher numbers and the higher coursework and so forth. And with that, so I want to take a quick pause here and show you this little chart from niche.com. Now niche.com, you may have heard of it, you may not have, but essentially it's sort of like a nice database of information where it can help you find the right schools in that area, the good, the ratings for basic, basically just about anything, neighborhoods, uh, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, the colleges, just who, ex who gets accepted, what, were the, what was the data, statistics, all of that stuff. So really we're looking at the acceptance rate into Yale. And if you look at this chart, you'll see that ultimately when it comes to, so if we look at the top right, now these are the students that have gotten the highest test scores and the highest GPAs. So you would think that this is where students get accepted, where this should be completely green for the accepted, except it's not. Instead, we see a lot of rejections. We see a lot of gray. And why is that? Ultimately, it's because universities want to see that I, I, you became a person, that you weren't just someone who was trying to do a bunch of activities to just check them off their list of this college applications list, so to speak, that you were able to find interest, explore your interests, and maybe just take them further because you liked to, because you wanted to, not because you felt compelled to. So notice that while we're still looking at this chart, that there are some students that are speckled in between that are accepted, meaning they don't have the highest GPAs or the SAT scores, yet they were accepted. So again, this just goes to point out that it's not just about the numbers, the personal component does really matter. So back to our topic of conversation when it comes to course load and GPAs and such, again, don't completely bombard yourself with the difficult courses um, if that's not really going, if that's not really your thing, if you're doing this just to check it off your list as yes, I have the numbers and yes, um, I'm going to do this activity, this activity, this, this, all of these activities, just so I look good on a college application. Don't do that. Um, mix it up with your coursework, mix it up with your extracurriculars. So coming back to coursework. Now your coursework is measured in two different units. First unit is your weighted GPA and your weighted GPA takes into account the difficulty level of your coursework. Meaning if you are in an AP class, an AP English class, let's say, 
Well, that class is going to be much more rigorous. There's much more reading, analysis, writing involved um, than there is in a regular English class. And therefore, let's say if you get an A in an AP English class, well, that took a lot more effort, a lot more time than getting an A in an English class would. And a weighted GPA takes that into account. So technically you receive a, a higher bump for getting an A on your, in your AP class than you would for just a regular English class. That applies, the same principle applies for honors classes versus regular classes. Ultimately, the weighted GPA just takes into account the difficulty level of that class. Unweighted GPAs, on the other hand, do not. These are the standard GPAs um, and what we think of when we think of GPAs, which are the typical out of 4.0, where do you stand? Good place to stand um, would be a 3.0 and above. So if you're in that category, you're doing really well, just make sure you keep it up. If you're trying to get, again, to a really competitive university, 3.5 and up is ideal. Um, but remember, it's not just your numbers, so make sure you have the other, the other parts of the application to back you up. Now, with that said, um, brings us to the next category, which is testing. Now, because of COVID, we know that testing is a little bit up in the air when it comes to how universities process it, because a lot of universities have gone test optional. At this point, and we are going to have plenty more videos about just testing and the breakdown between the two exams, SAT versus ACT and the scoring and so forth. But the most common question that I get right now is how should I take the SAT or should I take the ACT and how do I know? Ultimately, it comes down to what universities are you applying to? Because if you're applying to, let's say, a highly competitive university, where like NYU, BU, um, anywhere you know, in that category, and something in your application is lacking, whether that means your GPA is lower than what they would normally accept, whether that means you haven't done the, the time, you haven't put in the time for your extracurricular activities, uh, maybe you had a huge gap in between, uh, I've also had students who had concussions because of their sports and so forth, where it led to a dip in GPA and you couldn't do anything with extracurriculars. Well, either way, if you're trying to compensate for some portion of your GPA or your application, rather, then yes, I do recommend that you take the SAT or the ACT. And with that said, moving on to the third component, which is the personal. Personal components include things like your extracurricular activities. What did you do? Did you do 10 different things just so you have 10 different things in your application? Or did you do two to three things, but they were really something you were completely into and you went above and beyond because you really liked it? So what did you do with your extracurricular activities? And note here that there is no um, hierarchy, so to speak, meaning someone who plays sports is not better or worse than someone who simply choose, who chooses to do community service, volunteering. It's really, this is a very subjective area because that's pretty much the first part of the application. The numerical values are really the only objective components. And now we've entered the subjective area of which one's better, <laughs> volunteering or community or uh, sorry, sports. And the thing is there is no ranking system. It's just, what did the student do with the opportunity that they had? For example, I've had students who love their sports so much that they would then go out after all these hours of training and everything that I cannot comprehend because I have never in my life played a team sport, but apparently it's a thing. So I've had these students who just, even after all of the practices and the games and with the schoolwork and everything, they will still go out and say, okay, you know what? I love this sport so much. And I want to make sure that let's say these kids in Bridgeport or from anywhere else that just don't have the same advantages or the same resources to play the sport also get the opportunity to. So we're going to go out as a couple of us and or whether it's through a program, whether it's just through us and we created this project, but we're going to go just let them have fun and play soccer or help them play basketball and just coach them. So they went out of their way to now turn their sport into a community service project. Um, and it's something they enjoy. This doesn't feel like a burden to them. They actually look forward to working with these kids. So now you've found something that you enjoy doing and don't mind dedicating the time to. When an admissions officer reads that essay or reads that explanation in that application, that means so much more than the person who was like, yeah, I volunteered at a, at a homeless shelter, but then I also did this for the environment. And then I also did this at another soup kitchen. Then I also played this sport. And then I done, I played this sport because it was this season. Like, that's just a lot of, if you enjoy it, if you truly enjoy it, that's great. But if you're doing this to check it off, then they can usually tell this as an admissions officer, it's their job. So they can usually tell um, if the student was into it or if this was just a forced event, so to speak. 
All right, so that's that goes for the extracurricular activities. Next up on there, um, personal statements and supplemental essays. So personal statements or the college essay. Really, this is your first time, your first opportunity to introduce yourself to the admissions officer. Because other than that, everything else has been data, including your extracurricular activities. Because ultimately, um, you haven't really had to. They haven't. They've seen all the variations of activities at this point that you can possibly provide be, simply because of the influx of applications that they usually have to read. So that's all data. But now this is the first time that you as a student get to introduce yourself, to show your personality um, and add a human component to this application. So this, this essay is really where you get to show if you're funny, if you're serious, if, you had a, if you've worked hard on something that you really enjoy and interest so forth. So this is the first time that you get to include your human component. Um, and as such, do not BS it. You cannot emphasize that enough. Don't just BS it. Think it through. Um, all right, then the next part is your supplemental essay. So supplemental essays are really an extra essay that comes, or essays, that can come up depending on whichever universities you're applying to. So some universities have no supplemental essays and some, and some can have up to three. How do you know and what the topics are? Well, usually you can find them the essay requirements on the university's website. As for the topics, they vary, again, found on the university's website, but topics can be things like, why us? Why our university? To who was, um, who was someone that you admire? Um, explain one of your extracurricular activities in more detail. And some get funky, like, what if you could be an object, what object would you be and why? Or if, what is page 89 of your autobiography? And really when they get funky, it's just to see what your thought process is and what it is that, how you were gonna connect the dots and explain yourself. So word count on the personal essay or college essay, approximately 650 max. And for the supplemental essays, we're really looking at somewhere around, anywhere actually, from 150 to 600, really just depending on the university in that case. So those are the major components of sort of the personal section. And then we move on to the miscellaneous. Now, I, I categorize it under miscellaneous because it just, it's kind of random in some ways because that is where the recommendations are. So some universities require a couple different recommendations and some will just say, no, we only want the counselor recommendation and that's it. Um, and some will say, no, we don't want any recommendations because you're not going to ask anyone who's not going to write you a good recommendation to provide one. So we're really just spending our time reading a bunch of compliments about you. Excuse me. Um, so that's how recommendations can work. And then the second component would be interviews. So interviews, not every university has them, not any, and even those that have them, not all require them. And we'll do a separate mini video on that later, but ultimately what you need to know with interviews, uh, if it's offered, if it's anyway, it's optional and it's offered, then go ahead and do it. They can be done via video, FaceTime, Skype, those, that type of thing, um, especially during COVID, that's probably going to be the main approach. But again, do them because these also help add another sort of a personality, a human aspect to this application. So I recommend doing them. And then the final component is demonstrated interest. So this ends up being a big question mark, sort of a, how do I show that I'm interested in such and such university? Do I email them? Do I go on college tours? But the, the university is too far, a pre-COVID problem. Um, and the answer to that, one, yes, do the college tours. They do keep track of who does the college, who has attended college tours. And really, it, especially with COVID, it, these are all virtual at this point. So you have nothing to lose, they are free. Just go ahead and do them. If this is an outside of COVID situation where live tours are available, then just something to know that these will not, not going on a college tour will not count against you if the university's further away, meaning if it's, let's say, more than about three hours of driving distance away, then they're not going to count it against you because universities will not assume that you have the time and the resources to simply just make it out there and then go back home. So that's not an assumption the universities will make. However, if it's within a driving distance, you could do it on a day trip, then yes, it would be nice to have that as a part of your demonstrated interest. Um, other ways, they contact the university if you have any or admissions office if you have any questions genuine questions not not something that you could have read on one of the university page, you know one of the pages uh, or resources that the university provides so don't show that you haven't done your homework instead show that you really did and now here's a particular program and you have specific questions or something on that line um, and finally another way to show demonstrated interest is to apply with early action 
We will discuss the different deadlines a little bit later on, but with early action, all you really need to know. It's, it's not binding, it's just an earlier application deadline. And because it's not binding and there's really nothing to lose, most students tend to procrastinate. So application pool, pool is smaller. <laughs> application pool is smaller. And because it's smaller, um, you have a slightly better chance of getting accepted. And second, you know, you're now really showing the university that, check it out, I submitted this, I'm really interested because I made it a point to get this application to you by your earlier deadline instead of waiting for an extra two months for your regular deadline. So those are the three major components of your uh, miscellaneous category. So with that said, um, once again, a quick overview, the four different categories of your college applications process. Yes. The first one is coursework, second one is testing, third one is the personal, and the fourth one is just the miscellaneous aspects. So with that said, I hope this video was really helpful and we are going to roll out a couple of different videos to help you through each of those different aspects. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.